Hi everyone, this is Miss Moore and today we are starting our Earth Spheres Unit, an interesting blend of environmental science and ecology. We're starting by defining Earth's four spheres today. If you don't have a copy of the lesson notes in front of you, please feel free to make your own notes using lined paper or by typing out your notes as the video progresses. We're starting off with two warm-up questions today. What is an ecosystem and how do ecosystems depend on connectedness? Please pause the video here while you try these questions. An ecosystem is a community of living things that interact with each other and their physical environment. Examples might be like a rainforest ecosystem or an aquatic ecosystem. So how do ecosystems depend on connectedness? The living parts of an ecosystem are connected to each other and to the physical environment in the way that these organisms live, eat, build homes, etc. The classification of the environment into living and non-living things is one of the most important distinctions in ecology. All the living things in the environment are referred to as its biotic parts. These are the living components of the ecosystem, the populations of species that coexist in a community interacting with each other and the physical environment. In terms of Western science, some parts of the environment are not considered to be alive. These are referred to as the abiotic components of the environment and include climate, weather, nutrients, water, air, pH, salinity, soil, sunlight, all the things that are required by the living components but that are not alive themselves. Within an ecosystem, the biotic and abiotic parts of the environment are connected through the ways in which they interact with each other. The biotic part of an ecosystem is made up of communities of organisms arranged into populations and we define a population as a group of individuals of the same species living in the same geographic area. The natural processes that regulate matter on our planet are constantly moving matter in continuous cycles between the biotic and abiotic components of the environment. But at any time in this process, you can clearly identify the location of that matter as belonging to one or more of Earth's four spheres. The first sphere is called the geosphere. This is the solid, rocky portion of the Earth, from the surface materials to Earth's inner core. The geosphere encompasses all portions of this planet made of rock, which is quite a bit of it. Even soil belongs to the geosphere. The only difference between a soil like sand and a soil like clay is how fine that particle of rock has become over time. Sand is a very coarse grain, silt is a fine grain, and clay is even finer still. The biosphere includes all living things on Earth. Certain soils, which are rich and full of organic matter, breach these two categories because they include tiny rock particles, which belong to the geosphere, and little organisms living in those layers of soil, which belong to the biosphere. That kind of soil is called organic soil. The hydrosphere encompasses all the water on the planet. This includes water in solid, liquid, and gaseous form that exists within the immediate geosphere and atmosphere, which brings us to the atmosphere. This is the gaseous envelope that surrounds our planet. There are many layers to the atmosphere, the most concentrated layer of which is the first 10 kilometers above Earth's surface, but technically the atmosphere extends hundreds of kilometers above Earth's surface. 
We're now going to watch two short videos on YouTube. The first is called Four Spheres Part 1 and the second is called Four Spheres Part 2. And while we watch, we're aiming to answer the following questions. Firstly, what are the Greek origins of the following root words? Geo, bio, hydro, and atmos. Secondly, what are biomes and provide two examples? What is the troposphere and what is the stratosphere? Please pause this video here while you go to YouTube and watch these short clips. Okay, let's go over our answers together, starting with the Greek origins of the following root words. Geo, ground, bio, life, hydro, water, and atmos, air. What are biomes and provide two examples? Firstly, we should note that biomes can be terrestrial or marine, um, but usually when we refer to biome, we're referring to terrestrial biome because there is a huge amount of diversity in how we classify the different terrestrial biomes, the biomes on the land, whereas pretty much the entire ocean is referred to as the marine biome. These are regions of the biosphere with similar plants, animals, terrain, and climate. For example, you could have a forest biome, a desert biome, or a grassland biome. The troposphere is the lowest level of the atmosphere. It contains most of the air and weather. And if we draw a diagram, that will be very helpful in identifying the different layers of the atmosphere as they were presented in the film. The troposphere extends upward to about 10 kilometers above sea level. We humans live in the troposphere and nearly all weather occurs in this layer. Most of the clouds appear here mainly because 99% of the water vapor in the atmosphere is found in the troposphere. So then what is the stratosphere? This is the second level of the atmosphere. It contains the ozone layer which blocks UV rays. It extends from the top of the troposphere to about 50 kilometers above sea level. In this layer, the ozone molecules absorb high energy ultraviolet light from the sun and convert that energy into heat. It's really important that we're careful of what kind of chemicals we emit into the atmosphere so that we're not accidentally breaking down the ozone layer, which has happened historically. Unlike the troposphere, the stratosphere actually gets warmer the higher you go up, and that trend of rising temperatures with altitude means that the air in the stratosphere lacks the turbulence and updrafts of the troposphere below it. So that's actually the line that many commercial passenger jets try and fly, that line between the troposphere and the stratosphere. Next, we're going to do some examples. I'd like you to pause the video here while you try these examples on your own. Question 1. Which of Earth's spheres are involved when liquid water expands as it freezes and causes small cracks to form in rocks? Well, if you guessed hydrosphere, you are correct. If there's water involved, that means the hydrosphere is part of this problem. Also, the rocks belong to the geosphere. But there's a temperature change in the ambient air that causes this process to happen, and that belongs to the atmosphere. Number 2. Many first peoples talk about how all living and non-living things are connected and depend on one another. What does being connected mean to you? Now your answers will vary for this one, I'm sure. And really what I'm getting at with this question is the importance of understanding different perspectives on science, especially those of our indigenous communities. Because the worldview of many indigenous peoples includes the principle of connectivity, this idea that Everything in the universe is connected. Um, the spirit world is connected to the mortal, mortal world, the sea is connected to the land, the sky is connected to the ground, and that this connectivity explains the connection that we as people have to the land and the people of those communities have to their traditional territories and the ecosystems on those lands which sustain them as a people.
And this brings us to the topic of sustainability, which of course we mean environmental sustainability, the ability of our environment to exist infinitely at a cost. And that cost is the rate at which we're taxing it through things like renewable resource harvest, non-renewable resource depletion, pollution, um, any human activities which are damaging our environment, how well can it regenerate itself? Um, can it do can it regenerate itself at a rate that allows our activities to continue? So natural ecosystems in their untouched form, i.e. without us messing it up all the time, natural ecosystems are sustainable. They continue to exist indefinitely and they do this by recycling all their materials as long as they have a continued and constant source of energy, they can do this, well, for as long as the history of our planet. Natural ecosystems are always changing. That's how they survive. So what is sustainable for some organisms at some times in Earth history might not be sustainable at other points. Ecosystems also provide what we call ecosystem services, which sustain those ecosystems, including us. All living things depend on ecosystem services. So let's break these down. Provisioning services are the products obtained from ecosystems, such as food, fresh water, wood, fiber, genetic resources, medicines, anything that can be harvested from our natural environment or taken from our natural environment to ensure our survival. Regulating services are like benefits obtained from the environment because of the way in which it naturally regulates itself to process, um, to process waste, to process nutrients and maintain balance. So examples of ecosystem services are like climate regulation, natural hazard regulation, water purification, waste management, pollination, pest control, disease control. Cultural services are services that really only apply to humans because we're the only species, as far as we know, who have decided that we get benefits from things like aesthetic and spiritual um, aspects of our natural environment. So these are non-material benefits that people obtain from the place in which they live. And they're certainly measurable for humans. So um, this is a very important service that our natural environment provides for us as a species. So let's try example three. Um, for each of these ecosystem services below, it's your job to classify them as provisioning, regulating, or cultural, and write the corresponding letter to the left of each service. Please pause the video here while you do that. So I color quoted so I color coded my ecosystem services just to make it easier to compare our answers here. Um, so feel free to pause the video here while you just make sure you have the right designations. But what you'll notice is that for the most part, we rely heavily on so I color coded my services just to make it easier for us to compare our answers. Hopefully the descriptors here of each service was enough to help you match it with the correct service. Um, just taking a look here at some of the examples that were provided. Um, one of the ones you might not be familiar with is the idea of soil erosion control. So basically over time, uh, the soil in any given area, it could be soil on a coastline or even soil inland, the soil is worn away by natural processes like rain, wind, um, water flowing over land, and it carries the soil away and dumps it into water bodies. And what happens is you have this gradual loss of soil from areas where that soil is really needed, particularly along coastlines. If um, there's a concern of soil eroding away close to human communities along the coast, as well as erosion from agricultural fields where that soil is really needed in place for the growth of crops. 
So for the last part of today's lesson, we're going to do a case study on plastic waste by watching the short TED Ed video titled, What Really Happens to Plastic When You Throw It Away? Which you can view on YouTube. Um, and as you're watching, we're trying to So for our last part of today's lesson, we're going to do a quick case study on plastic waste by watching a TED Ed video titled, What Really Happens to Plastic When You Throw It Away? Which you can access at this link. The questions we're trying to answer as we watch are, what is leachate? What is the Great Pacific Garbage Patch and where is it? And most plastics don't biodegrade. What does this mean? Please pause the video here while you watch the case study and respond to these questions. Okay, let's go over our answers together. What is leachate? The video describes this as a toxic stew that seeps out of landfills into surrounding soil and groundwater. It's basically water that has passed through some kind of solid material and leached out some of its constituents and then carries those along with it as it enters other layers of the soil profile or groundwater and contaminates them. What is the Great Pacific Garbage Patch and where is it? Well, this is sadly a location in the Pacific Ocean where the ocean's currents have trapped millions of pieces of plastic debris which have been cast off by countries with inappropriate waste disposal management practices that just dump garbage into the ocean or surprisingly a fair amount of it just comes from litter that's picked up by heavy rainfall and carried into water bodies which ultimately arrives in the ocean and um, this huge pile of plastic is just floating there polluting the ocean and killing marine life here it is isn't that tragic? Question three. Most plastics don't biodegrade. What does this mean? It means they do not break down fully and they cannot reintegrate into the natural ocean ecosystem. So the way that plastics actually break down is when they're exposed to ultraviolet light and they break down really slowly. So for example, one of the most common plastics found in your garbage can right now is probably polystyrene which is um, which takes about five ish centuries to degrade if exposed to ultraviolet radiation that entire time um, if not it can persist for thousands of years making it practically eternal why are plastics in the ocean such a serious problem for marine life? Well, if it's big pieces like those segments of plastic that hold together pop cans, marine life can become trapped in them. Or if they're small enough to be ingested, they'll be gobbled up and then the poor little organism will think that it's full and starve to death because it will stop eating. So not to end our lesson on a sad and tragic note, um, unfortunately, before we can start um, moving forward in this world with the correct behavior, we have to identify what we've done wrong. So that is part of one of the reasons why this unit starts off so intensely. In fact, good luck finding a branch of environmental science that that's not intense or um, a branch of ecology that's not dealing with species endangerment or pollution or natural habitat destruction. That's just how we live as a species. So hopefully we can um, learn from the mistakes of the past and you guys will be the generation that make the policy changes needed to protect the planet where we live. Um, so without further ado, please go ahead and start assignment one on the melting Arctic ice cap and have a lovely day. Bye for now.